The pursuit of happiness is a tricky thing. Conflation of an idea that has been either poorly defined or had its definition bastardized with temporary feelings and joy has been detrimental to the society and culture we find ourselves a part of. One need look no further than the mass confusion we see in our society around everything from money to sexualization to wonder if Mr. Jefferson made some kind of mistake in his use of that phrase in the Declaration of Independence. Our politics and our people have suffered from an overly materialistic pursuit that places the gain above the process, and in nearly every case leaves us feeling hollow and shortchanged in our experiences. Our culture today in America is fast-paced and unhealthy. We have replaced the rhythm of living with the breakneck pace and pragmatism required for keeping up with our self-imposed pursuits. After all, we rationalize, if the pursuit of happiness is good enough for the founders, it certainly should be good enough for me. So we find ourselves eating mass-produced, overly chemically covered food, consuming substances that numb or suppress our stresses in order to cope with the stresses and frustrations of day-to-day -day life, and making choices in our businesses, work, and family life that are expedient to gains but detrimental to the quality of life. We take advantage of our habitats and our proverbial neighbors in order to obtain what feels like the unachievable goal established in our founding documents. Nothing in our system seems to be about altruism, and so we acquiesce the moral standards we might hope to hold because no one seems to be able to plant themselves upon the high ground of nobility. So we toil and break in an endless cycle of frustration, unable to move out of the hamster wheel of self-induced suffering. We get to the milestone moments of our lives and see our children leave home, our parents pass away, our spouses grow old, and we look back with disappointment and disdain that we have somehow, in our pursuing happiness, missed out on everything meaningful. We find ourselves exhausted, depressed, and angry that this system has beaten the very thing out of us, happiness, that we were intended to be striving for. Yet if I take a step back and ask myself what all of this is about, I am forced to look closer at the words that Jefferson chose and ask if this endless treadmill was what he really meant when he wrote those words down as the galvanizing idea as to why leaving the British Empire was the best course forward for the people of this magnificent land. When Jefferson released his candid facts to the world, many recognized a familiar expression about rights from John Locke, who said that natural rights included life, liberty, and the acquisition of property. But in the Declaration, Jefferson turns the phrase to pursuit of happiness. This strange change seems irreconcilable in our moment. Happiness is far from our current state. We battle so many things that seem to be the opposite of what we believe happiness to be. Yet, Jefferson knew his Aristotle and seems to be referring to the concept of eudaimonia. This is an idea of a life well lived in pursuit of virtue and joy. Aristotle presupposes that the two ideas cannot be separated. Certainly temporal joy and wealth can be pursued without virtue, but true happiness or eudaimonia is unavailable without hanging it equally in yoke with being noble. If one cannot love his neighbor as himself, then happiness is as Aristotle describes of observable nature in Nicomachean Ethics. For as it is not one swallow or one fine day that makes a spring, so it is not one day or a short time that makes a man blessed and happy. Jefferson was asking for something far more than temporary satiation or wealth in using these words. I think instead he was using Aristotle's hierarchy of nature to ask us to pursue something more than self-interest. It seems that our unique function is to reason. By reasoning things out, we attain our ends, solve our problems, and hence live a life that is qualitatively different in kind from plants or animals. The good for a human is different from the good for an animal because we have different capacities or potentialities. We have a rational capacity, and the exercising of this capacity is thus the perfecting of our natures as human beings. For this reason, pleasure alone cannot constitute human happiness, for pleasure is what animals seek, and human beings have higher capacities than animals. The goal is not to annihilate our physical urges, however, but rather to channel them in ways that are appropriate to our natures as rational animals. If we look to this definition of happiness, then nearly everything about the current American experience needs re-examination. Instead of a relentless pursuit of self-interest and gain, we have a responsibility of temperance of our own gain against that of our neighbors. For if the gain is ignoble, then the gain is only fleeting and whatever happiness it has provided will be fleeting and eventually destructive. He is happy who lives in accordance with complete virtue and is sufficiently equipped with external goods. 
not for some chance period, but throughout a complete life. Aristotle, and by proxy, Jefferson are asking of people to move into the highest kind of virtue, one that in Greek is called aret. It's the one that Christ describes in his description to the lawyer who, in trickery, asks what the greatest commandment is. As Christ answers, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and the second greatest is to love your neighbor as yourself. There is no greater commandment than these. Jefferson, I believe, is elevating our aspirations beyond mere acquisition of property and wealth into a much larger and grander idea for the new republic. He seems to be asking of us, the collective people of this new experiment, to pursue the virtue of neighborliness and friendship. So while there are different kinds of friendships, the highest is one that is based on aret, the concept of a person wishing the best for their friends, regardless of utility or pleasure. Aristotle calls it a complete sort of friendship between people who are good and alike in virtue. So if this is the charge we are given by Jefferson in his declaration, we would be wise to re-examine how we are functionally living this out. Are we living as well as we could for our neighbors in our business, in our family life, in our communities, in our politics? Is there more happiness available to us as a society if we choose to live in noble pursuit of others' interests over our own? Being thoughtful about what happiness is, particularly as described in the fullest definition by Aristotle and Jefferson, might lead us to a more civil society. It might make our lawmaking more inclined to the citizen rather than the politician or their benefiting donors. Our world could be shaped into something grand in this pursuit. Our economics and projections around the world in force might be tempered and checked by the ethics of loving others over self. Perhaps we wouldn't be always pursuing the control of the world we so desperately gripped to if we were magnanimous in our relationships. Sitting at the table in either global or domestic conversation would be oriented to the benefit of the whole rather than the elevation of ourselves at the expense of others. Conflicts might be less omnipresent. Evaporations of our people and their stability would become self-evident of their destruction instead of hidden behind names that say the noble but mask the real intent. Patriot Acts and Cares Acts would be seen in this new frame of reference for the darkness they hold because they would be evidentiary of their abuses and for their lack of the basis of eudaimonia, and a noble people would dismiss them for their obvious abuses. Our Republic would be better off to pursue the Jeffersonian version of happiness. It will shape us into the vision that once was seen upon this magnificent continent. Thanks for watching. The Lonely Hipster channel is designed for education and edification in an era of our republic that seems faltering. These essays are my thoughts and ruminations about philosophies and concepts that might make our world a better place. If you are so inclined, please share these if they spur on thought or you resonate with the concepts. A public that is educated is one that can preserve its liberty, generation after generation.